essays hop from beginning. Got it. All right. So thank you everyone for coming this afternoon to this session of Little Essays Toward Truth. Today we are exploring the essay on Beatitude. And per usual, if you have read the essay, awesome. If you haven't read the essay, we're going to read it today. I am Sora Mackay, and I suck at PowerPoint, so I was really hoping that these pretty little bubbles would show up on the rest of my slides, and I couldn't figure out how to make that happen, so too bad. If you are not uh, currently a member of Second Mop, we would sincerely appreciate a donation of any amount. $10 is a suggestion if you've got one or five or, you know, 3,000. We'll take what you got. You can either go to the PayPal me slash second mot, or you can head to pdxoto.org. And that money is used to help pay our expenses, which we still have some going month to month, but we are also saving up some bucks to get our own space. This is the standard disclosure, which I try to alter a little every week so you don't get bored of it. I am not an expert. I just spent a lot of time on this essay because it was interesting. My opinions might be different than yours and you may get offended. So your mileage may vary. Be prepared to play along and have a good sense of humor, but I really do welcome everyone's thoughts and opinions because like I said, I'm not an expert. I like to pretend that I know it all, but um, I definitely don't, so. All right, so Beatitude, what the hell is that? These are the titles of Crowley's essays in Little Essays Toward Truth. And these, so you read these across in lines. We started with man, went to memory, talked about sorrow and wonder. The attitude falls in there. But then just look at the titles of the other essays. Laughter, indifference, mastery, trance, energy, knowledge, understanding, chastity, silence, love, truth. With the exception of maybe chastity, the rest of these are words that you probably use on a, an everyday basis or on a somewhat, maybe on a somewhat infrequent basis with words like indifference. But beatitude is one of the ones that stands out as not something that we use in everyday common uh, speech these days. So I thought, you know, you guys know me, I'm going to go to the dictionary first. So beatitude comes from the Latin beatus, the word beatitudo is the word for blessed, it's the adjective form. Um, it was absorbed into French as beatitude and came into late Middle English around when the Norman conquest of uh, England took place. You can blame the French for our ownership of the word beatitude. The basic definitions are supreme blessedness or exalted happiness. The beatitudes refers to a set of blessings given by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll talk about later. Beatitude is also a title given to patriarchs in the Orthodox Catholic Church, which I did not know and find fascinating. Um, and it's also a status in the Catholic Church as people are beatified before they become saints. So why did Crowley pick the word beatitude? Why didn't he pick blessed? Anybody got thoughts? All right. My thought is that he chose beatitude because it has an inherently religious context. And I think if you think of beatitude as being a word that is associated with religious and spiritual things, it may help you a little bit more with the understanding of the content of this essay. Of course, it might not. Like I said, your mileage may vary. So whenever I talk about Crowley and things that have a religious context, I tend to go to the Bible first because when Crowley was growing up, that was really the only book that he had in his household. And specifically, Crowley would have had the Darby Bible, so I try to pull as many of the, the sources as I can from there. So first, let's talk about the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you are not familiar with Christianity, I always try to throw a little stuff in there so you don't have to know all the background material. But essentially, the Sermon on the Mount is a collection of sayings and teachings of Christ, and it emphasizes moral teachings. Found in Matthew, which is the first gospel in the, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, it's, what, it's also one of what they call the, the discourses. There are five kind of big Jesus speeches in Matthew, and this is the first one. So this particular sermon took place pretty early in the ministry of Jesus. He had just been baptized by John the Baptist. He had finished fasting. He'd gone on a meditation retreat. 
meditation retreat. You might want to think about that for a second. Um, and he started to preach in Galilee. So this is also the longest section of the Bible that is a continuous discourse, like a, a speech that was given by Jesus sort of all at once in one place, allegedly, according to some old dead guy who wrote it down, inspired by God, big air quotes. Um, it, in addition to the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount also includes what's known as the Lord's Prayer. What are the Beatitudes? Basically, it's a collection of blessed are you, blessed are you. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. By the way, those little asterisk stars were not added by me. They came from the Darby Bible online that I cut and pasted this one. So do with them what you will. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at who is blessed, according to the Sermon on the Mount, and um, what they get out of it. So if you look at the people on the left side, we have the poor in spirit, people that are mourning, the meek, people hungering and thirsting after righteousness, people who are persecuted, the pure in heart, the merciful. Um, and these are all characteristics that were um, sort of held up as good things in, in the Christian teachings, right? Um, mourning, being meek, having, you know, looking for righteousness, being merciful, being pure, being a peacemaker. So I thought looking at their gifts that they were getting in exchange for being so blessed was pretty interesting. Um, the poor in spirit get the kingdom of the heavens. And from a tree of life perspective, to me, that would be Cather, the crown, the top Sephiroth in the tree diagram, um, or maybe above that, if you want to think of the, uh, the nothing, nothing of nothing, and nothing of nothing of nothing as being the actual heavens. Um, the morning get comfort. I wasn't sure where to map that. But the meek are the ones that are going to inherit the earth. I was like, wait, the meek gets stuck at Malkuth? That doesn't seem like a deal to me, but okay, whatever. Um, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, this is a specific metaphor. They're not talking about physical and hunger and thirst. But what they get is to be filled, presumably, with, you know, the spirit of God. Um, on, a, on the Malkuth plane, I thought, okay, this is kind of like uh, in communion, right? Not hungering and not thirsting. The merciful shall find mercy, which seems like a better deal to me, because at least they make it up as far as Chesed on the tree of life. Um, the pure in heart get to see God, which reminded me of the vision of God face to face, which is the spiritual vision of Chokmah. And by the way, if you're not familiar with the Kabbalistic tree of life, don't get too excited. Um, where you actually need to care about it later, I promise I'll give you a little education. Um, the peacemakers get to be called sons of God, like Jesus. And son of God also goes along with son as in the son, as in Tifereth, which will play a large role in our discussion of beatitude later on. Those persecuted due to righteousness, well, I guess they're sharing the kingdom of the heavens with the poor in spirit, so I guess they get Cather. Uh, and the reproached and persecuted or prosecuted, their reward is great in heaven. And I'm not sure if that means that they're going to become saints because it was later on the, the saints who were martyred, or the, later on the martyrs automatically became saints. But um, anyway, there's that. So the Beatitudes are also echoed in the Sermon on the Plain, which is another one of the Gospels, Luke, the third Gospel. This is another long set of teachings by Jesus. Uh, again, it starts with he spends the night somewhere on a mountain praying to God, which you can think of as a type of meditation. Then two days later is when he chose these 12 people to become apostles. And we all know 12 is a nice, fun, magic number. So on the way down the mountain, a bunch of people were gathered. He had to do a little healing, a little curing of those with unclean spirits, and then he gave the Sermon on the Plain. Now, this is notable not just for its inclusion of the Beatitudes, but for a lot of the core teachings that people think about or that even non-Christians may have heard of. So, for example, the idea to love your enemies as yourself, um, to turn the other cheek, the idea of the golden rule, the uh, judge not lest thou also be judged, um, the idea that the blind can't lead the blind, that you need a teacher, so your disciples are not above your teacher, uh, kind of setting the hierarchy and setting up Christianity as a hierarchical religion. Um, the, you know, bad trees give bad fruit, good trees give good fruit. 
uh, the idea of why do you call me Lord, but not do what I command. So um, something to be said for walking the, the talk. Uh, and then finally, uh, from all of my summer Bible camp songs, building your church on a rock, which is the, the word and teachings of Jesus. And if you don't build your, your church on a rock, you're building on sand and will be destroyed. So the sermon on the plain, um, what I've done here is on the left, you can see there's a column of who is blessed from the Beatitudes. So you can compare on the right, uh, who is blessed in the Sermon on the Plain. So we have blessed are the poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Not the poor in spirit, just the poor. Blessed uh, are ye that hunger now. So not hunger for righteousness, but hunger. Blessed are ye that weep, not necessarily mourn. Um, blessed are ye when men shall hate you. And if you look at the four, four sets of people who are blessed up in the top are in yellow, you can compare them with the four on the bottom in orange, and those are the four woes. So ye poor are blessed, but woe to you rich, right? The, those that hunger are blessed, but woe to those that are filled. Uh, those who, who are weeping, blessed. If you're laughing, not so blessed, woe to you. Uh, and so on and so forth. Right. So Beatitude also has an inherently religious context in the Orthodox Catholic Church. Now, I don't know how much anyone on the, this class knows about the difference between the Orthodox Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church, but whereas the Roman Catholic Church is a very strict hierarchy, the Orthodox Catholic Church is more like a group of churches that mostly believe the same stuff as the Catholics, but really weren't down with the chain of command. And so they broke away uh, in like 1050 something um, and formed their own communion. So they don't have a single like head warmonger Pope in charge guy. They have a council of patriarchs. So let's patriarchs. Uh, John Pope, nine Orthodox patriarchs. And I found it interesting to see where they are located because I think of Alexandria and Antioch and Jerusalem as being sort of, you know, Christian biblical places. Uh, I don't so much think about Bulgaria and Serbia and um, always the first one listed is Constantinople, not Istanbul. For those of you that are, they might be Giants fans. Uh, the, the Archbishop or Patriarch of Constantinople is kind of interesting because the entire uh, during the entire history of the development of the Middle East, as it were, Turkey has been a, a country that has gone east and has gone west. And so there's been a lot of traffic in all kinds of religions through Turkey. And they've had both very uh, theistic states where the government and the religion were basically the same. And then there was a later break. Anyway, I could go on for a long time, but if you're interested, uh, hit me up later. I have an excellent text I can recommend that is pretty reader friendly that will blow your mind about the history of the Middle East. Anyway. So Beatitude is a title that's used in some styles of address with the, the Eastern Orthodox patriarchs. Um, they have titles like Beatitude or Eminence. Um, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople is called his All Holiness. So he is one of the patriarchs, but so is the Metropolitan Bishop of Thessaloniki in Greece. Who knows why? That's just how it is. So some of the patriarchs, the ones in Alexander, Antioch and Jerusalem are referred to as his most godly beatitude. Uh, and so the Serbian, Bulgarian, and Russian patriarchs are called his holiness. The Romanian patriarchs are called his beatitude. And the patriarch of the Georgian Orthodox Church, which Georgia being not Georgia, our state, of course, but Georgia, the former um, Soviet Socialist Republic, he is called his holiness and beatitude. Now, I would have felt bad if I hadn't put in Bartholomew the first, um, even though he doesn't use the title Beatitude. He is officially his most divine all holiness, Bartholomew the first, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch. Except in Turkey, because Turkey is a special case. Again, the influx of the East and the West and the, the mixing of religions there has led to some interesting things happening. So in Turkey, he is officially Bartholomew the first, Patriarch, of the Fanar Roman Orthodox Patriarchate in Istanbul. This is Patriarch Theodore II of Alexandria. His official title is His Divine Beatitude, the Pope and Patriarch of the Great City of Alexandria, Libya, Pentapolis, 
Ethiopia, all Egypt and all Africa, father of fathers, pastor of pastors, prelate of prelates, the 13th of the apostles, and judge of the ecumen. Who doesn't want a title like that, right? I mean, you get a hat better than Guinan and you get better bling than Run DMC. Like, why wasn't I an Orthodox Catholic? Anyway, moving on to the Roman Catholics. The attitude also has an inherently religious context within the Roman Catholic Church. I learned a lot about Roman Catholic saints that I really didn't need to know, but here we go. So Roman Catholic sainthood, really in the late 10th century is around the time when the process for making saints started to get formalized up the food chain. So prior to that, it was kind of, um, you know, willy nilly, you die a martyr, you get to be a saint, poof, you move on. Um, but the, in the Roman Catholic papacy was struggling for supremacy at that point. And one of the ways to obtain ecclesiastical authority is to have the final say on something, which included making saints. Now in 1054, that's when we had the great East-West schism. So the Roman Catholic Church split with the Orthodox Catholic Church in large part over the authority of the Pope. So prior to 1054, if you were a Catholic saint, you are now both a Roman Catholic saint and an Orthodox Catholic saint. After 1054, you may or may not be a saint in one if you are a saint in the other. We'll talk about that later. In 1588, so roughly 400 years later, 500 years later, the process of saint making was formalized under Pope Sixtus V when he established the Congregation of Rites. Uh, it didn't really have much significant change for another 400 years when in 1969, Pope Paul VI reorganized it and renamed it the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. And then apparently, you know, it needed reforming again, not even 20 years later, because Pope John Paul made the Congregation for the Causes of Saints part of the Roman Curia. And in addition to recommending the beatification and canonization, they're also in charge of authenticating and preserving holy relics. Now, just for context here, 1066, the Norman Conquest, happens pretty much right after the schism here. And that's when English starts to acquire the word beatitude from the French, because the Norman Conquest is what brought all the French words that we stole in English. Everybody happy so far? Questions, comments, rude remarks? I know I talk fast, but I really want this all to mash into 90 minutes, and I want me to not be the only person that talks. So on to the next topic. Beatification, according to the OED, is an act by the Pope which declares that a deceased member of the church is in the enjoyment of heavenly bliss and grants to certain persons the privilege of paying a particular form of worship or reverence to him. This ceremony is the first step, uh, footnote, technically it's the second step, toward canonization, which confers the full honors of a saint and makes worship of him incumbent on the whole church. Since I had a bunch of uh, white guys as religious authorities, I've given you St. Rose of Lima, patroness of embroiderers, gardeners, florists, those who suffer ridicule for their piety, and people who suffer from family problems. She's also the first important saint and patron saint of um, Latin America, of the New World. So, oh, how to become a Roman Catholic saint in three easy steps. Step one, first you must become venerable. Now, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, which is the Department of the Roman Curia, will examine the life of the candidate. They are looking for a life of heroic virtues. And you can actually go to the website for the Curia and for the Congregation for Causes of Saints and read all of this and like all the official Catholic legal doctrine-y stuff. But basically they're looking for, for two big things. They're looking for theological virtues, which are faith, hope, and charity. And that would be specifically Roman Catholic faith, not just any faith. They're also looking for cardinal virtues, which they identify as prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Now, I didn't add this to the slide, but there are other virtues that they can consider. Um, you have to be deceased for at least five years in order to become venerable, although the Pope, being the supreme authority in the Roman Catholic Church, has the authority to basically waive any damn rule he wants, so um, he can waive the uh, waiting period. Here we have, again, to counter all the uh, white guys I had earlier, the Blessed Maria Pia Mastena, and she is actually not just venerable, she is also beatified, because she is the Blessed. Step two in becoming a Catholic saint, after you become venerable, you can come beatified. Now, if you died a martyr, you get to skip veneration and head straight to beatification. 
to die a martyr is to be killed specifically for adhering to your Roman Catholic faith. There is a matter of debate over a couple of saints who were persecuted um, during World War II and died in concentration camps where the Nazis had interned them because they were of Jewish heritage, even though they had already converted to Roman Catholicism. And there's apparently some like tension and unhappy people about that because they weren't killed for being Catholic, they were killed for being Jews. And so does that really count as being a martyr or not? Well, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints said yes, so your opinion doesn't matter. Anyway, if you don't die a martyr, the second option is to pass through being venerable and then achieve a miracle. And the way that happens is they, the congregation um, actually goes out and talks to people and verifies all these things and investigates and looks at science and blah, blah, blah. But basically, living humans have to pray to you as a saint to intercede with God on their behalf and you have to make it happen. I'd like you to stop for a moment and consider how this is very different from what it is that the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, our Thelemic Church, believes of our saints. We don't pray to our saints because we need someone to talk to God for us. We have that whole, you know, there's no part of me that's not of the gods. I don't need to talk to some stinking saint to talk to God. But in the Roman Catholic faith, you require an intercessor to take your prayers because as a sinner, you are unworthy to speak to God personally. It's kind of like you can't call him up. You got to talk to the secretary and then hope that she likes you. So after you've achieved your miracle, um, technically becoming beatified is an administrative act, although it does require the recognition of the Pope. Now, ordinarily the Pope does not perform the ceremony and the announcement and the mass that celebrate your beatification, but in certain uh, very political and very clever ways, um, Pope John Paul used that to his advantage, Pope John Paul II, I mean, and he did perform some of the masses that were beatification masses, helping to uh, strengthen the Catholic faith in areas of the world where it may have been lacking, lagging. Once you're beatified, what's your prize? In public veneration. So usually that means that the diocese where you were a, a nun or a monk or a priest or whatever, or your um, congregation or your region or the religious community where you were, they are allowed to recognize you as blessed and essentially count you among the saints, but you have to be specified as blessed and not referred to as saint somebody or another. So here we have the blessed Benedetta Bianchi Poro, who is one of the most recently beatified. She was beatified in 2019. All right, step three, you need a second miracle. That's basically what it boils down to. Now, the Roman Catholic process of becoming a saint is very legalistic. The canonization involves the infallibility of the Pope. So once you are canonized, that's like it. The Pope don't make no mistakes. Um, I read an Eastern Orthodox uh, explanation of this system, so I thought it was interesting to look at how the Eastern Orthodox make their saints. They don't have a process for beatification or for canonization. They have one step, and that is glorification. Um, the priest that I looked at, because of course it's all priests writing on this stuff, um, said that the Roman Catholic Church has an emphasis on salvation through logic, obedience, and procedure. Essentially, these are the same complaints that the Eastern Orthodox or Orthodox Catholic churches were making against the Roman Catholics when the Pope was trying to take control of the world back in 1050. In the Orthodox Catholic faith, glorification is not, the glorification of a saint is not seen as making a saint. It is not the authority of a patriarch that makes a saint. It is just the church figuring out, oh, God has told us this person is in heaven, therefore they are a saint. Boom. Fun fact. All right, so since we talked about the Bible and about other predecessor religions, I always like to look at what the word of the day is or the essay of the day is, how it appears in the holy books of Thelema. And since the word beatitude didn't appear too often, I took a little liberty and also looked up the word blessed to see what I could come up with. There are three holy books that have the word beatitude and or the word blessed. The first is Liber Liberi. Um, Liber, as you may know, was a god of wine and debauchery, somewhat Dionysus-like, hence the glass of wine. Look at me being so clever. Uh, there are two references. One is to the beatitude of the great goddess. And one is a reference to God. O blessed one, O God, O my devourer. The second book is Liber Corda Sancti Serpente. And there are two references. One is to blessed be thy name. 
O thou son of a light transcending mother, blessed be thy name. And then there's also uh, later on a reference to a blessed one. O blessed one, O boy of beatitude. So he gets to be blessed and be one of beatitude, excuse me, all in the same fell swoop. Book of the law, eh? look at that. I found clip art. Um, just uses the word blessed once, does not use the word beatitude or any variation thereof. And it is in book three, which I thought was, or chapter three, which I thought was interesting. Ye shall see that hour, O blessed beast, and thou the scarlet concubine of his desire. So however these may inform your understanding of Crowley's essay, those are your three sets of references to Beatitude in our holy books. Now, before we actually get to the essay, I thought it'd be good to take a quickie on Tifereth. This is, this is I don't do art, okay? <laughs> So I, the big black bar, which I really tried to make a straight line, um, I'll work on that better for next time, that's the abyss. And the yellow donut is Tifereth. It is also referred to as Shemesh, the sphere of the sun. There are three magical images associated with Tifereth, which I would invite you to take note of. They are a majestic king, a child, and a sacrificed god. So at first glance, these may seem to have nothing in common, but they might have something in common in a minute. The, the text from the Sefer Yetzirah is, the sixth path is called the meditating, meditating, hmm, where have we seen that before? Meditating intelligence, because in it are multiplied the influences of the emanations, for it causes that influence to flow into all the reservoirs of the blessings with which they themselves are united. Tifereth has a relationship to every other Sephirah on the tree. If you ignore Doth, which is not really a Sephirah, but appears under my black line, Abyss, you can draw a direct line from Tifereth to every other Sephiroth on the path, on the tree. You can go directly, well, except for Malkuth, because you'd have to pass through Yasod. But uh, Malkuth aside, you can start in Tifereth and move to any other sphere. It's the middle of the middle pillar. So it's it's our base of equilibrium. This is the point of stillness. You can think of it as Cather on a lower arc. So Cather is this guy at the top up here. Whoops. And if you were to fold the tree in half, you can kind of see that this would be, these two go together, right? You can also think of it as Yesod here, moving a little bit on a higher arc. Um, if you're looking at it from a Malkuth point of view, since you traveled from just the world of the meat suit and the physical things up into the middle of the formative world, from Malkuth, it is a king. And when, if you think of Kether as the crown and Tifereth as a reflection of that crown, thus you can see we have the king, the child, and what was the third one? Oh yeah, a sacrificed god. We'll get to him in a minute. <clears throat> So the, the top six Sephiroth on the tree, starting from Cather and coming down to Tifereth, these six here are called Adam Cadmon and are sometimes seen as the archetypal, archetypical man. And I found that interesting because all of Little Essays Toward Truth, according to Crowley, is about man. And that is, in fact, the title of the first essay. Um, stepping aside and out of Crowley language for a moment, uh, a lot of the Kabbalistic books that I consulted on this said that the four Sephiroth that are below Tefera, so these, these three plus Malkuth hanging out down here at the bottom, they are sort of the lower self. The, the, I mean, here's your physical body, right? And here's your animal soul, according to Crowley. So you've moved up out of that lower self. And then the four that are left, ex excluding Cather because it's the crown, um, the four that are left are the rest of the higher self, Cather being the divine spark. Um, I also thought it was interesting to read some other commentary on um, Tifereth because Tifereth goes with Beatitude, which you'll see when we get to the essay, which I promise is coming. Um, exoteric religion or the external, uh, you know, go to church, do Sunday school, whatever your version of that is, go to uh, Saturday prayers, go to Friday services really only goes to Tifereth. It doesn't go any further up the tree because it's all looking at these lower um, external things as opposed to the, the, what I would call the real work in big giant air quotes, the internal work. So 
exoteric religion doesn't have any understanding of the mystery of creation. That happens way up here above the abyss. It doesn't have any understanding of the bright and dark archangels who are Geburah and Chesed, the next two that are above, and has no consciousness uh, of the consciousness and transmutation of force and knowledge, which is Doth, which is not really a Sephiroth, but remember it, it hangs out up there in the abyss. You can think of Tifereth as God made manifest or as a reflection. It can be seen as the sun, as Jesus is the son of God in Christianity. He would be hanging out in Tifereth, but sun also represents the sun, the you know, solar orb that is the thing that gives light and life and sustenance to those of us that are embodied on this planet. Um, if you're mapping the fall, uh, the fall of man, the biblical story of the Garden of Eden, you know, where Eve's like, hey, let's have a snack. I think that tree looks good, right? And the serpent is like, oh, this will give you the knowledge. Um, the head of the serpent, the head of the great serpent only reaches Tifereth. It's not shown as going down any further, which I thought was very interesting. So that, that uh, bite, that hey, take a bite, ends here in Tifereth. Um, Tifereth is also in uh, a Christian interpretation where the Redeemer manifests. And if you look at Cather as the top and Malkuth as the bottom, and you were to fold this in half so that Cather and Malkuth met, Tifereth would be your exact middle. Um, Gareth Knight wrote that an understanding of Tifereth is almost synonymous with an understanding of the whole tree. So symbols associated with Tifereth, which may also, you may also want to associate with your understanding of Beatitude, include the Laman, uh, the Rosy Cross, the Calvary Cross, which is essentially a big public thing in a box, uh, the truncated pyramid, so the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill with its head cut off, it's kind of flat on top instead of pointy, that one. Um, the cube of space, which if you think about uh, the cube as being able to unfold as it has six sides, if the center of the cross is one box or one square on that cube, you just have to have one box to the top, one box to the left, one box to the right, and the other two boxes go underneath to make a cross. So the idea of cross and cube go together here. Um, I also added associated with the keystone because the keystone is the stone in the arch in architecture that is it's load bearing and it is the it's literally the key um, it is what holds together the rest of the arch especially in times before things like you know nails and mortar and advanced architectural techniques in the modern age being that it is the sixth sephiroth tifereth is associated with the sixes and these are represented by victory joy earned success and material success the archangel is Raphael because Raphael is the archangel who standeth in the sun and Tifereth is associated with the sun. I think this is my last slide on Tifereth, I promise, but I got really excited about this. The spiritual experience of Tifereth is knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel, which is sometimes seen as a reflection here in Tifereth of the reality of the divine spark of God that lives in Kether. The vision of the harmony of things, the trance of beatitude. It is where the mysteries of the crucifixion lie, and that's where that dying uh, God, redeemer God, crucified God comes in. Also crucified, cross, box, cube, they all go together. It is also where the beatific vision lives. The virtue of Tifereth is devotion to the great work. Essentially, you're halfway there, right? I mean, if you started down here at the bottom in, in the world of uh, Milkuth, you're essentially halfway to Tifer or to uh, Kether. But the vice uh, is pride. So think about um, people who are particularly devoted to what it is they do and how pride can be a vice in relationship. All right, so does anyone have any questions or comments on all of that before we dive into the essay? And like really everyone's welcome to open up and yap because I want to hear what you think. Uh, I have just a comment on the, um, the Catholic doctrine point. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, so I went through the RCIA as an adult, which is the right of Catholic initiation for adults. And mm -hmm. they make you go every week and teach you about Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And coming from a Protestant background, one of the questions that I had was about this need for an intercessor, right? Because mm -hmm. in the Protestant Reformation, that was one of the big things that Martin Luther brought up, right? right. Um, well, like I actually, at one point, when that was a topic of conversation, just directly asked the priest, 
And he wouldn't answer me on that point. I was like, look, do I actually need to, can I pray to God and will God answer my prayers or do I need to go to a saint or to, you know, an angel or to whatever, right? Because my understanding is that God will answer anyone's prayers directly. So why do you need an intercessor? And um, what I just wanted them to do was to, was to give me a doctrinal answer. Sure. Mm -hmm. And since they couldn't, my assumption is that there's no doctrinal requirement for an intercessor. It's just part of the tradition of the church is to provide that for people who think that they need it. Interesting point. I, I didn't grow up Roman Catholic, so I appreciate anybody who's got firsthand experience. Um, I do think the reason I think of them as that of being a requirement is because you have to go take communion as a sacrament as a requirement, right? Yeah, You're supposed to do right. that. And you can't DIY communion in the Catholic Church. No, you absolutely not. Yeah, you got to have the priest to do it. Yeah. Whereas if I want to do a Eucharistic ritual at home in my apartment, me, yeah. penis little woman, yeah. I can consecrate my own sacrament and do my own ritual. You know, that's so interesting to me because I think that a lot of the things that I've seen the priests do in the church um, really informs me in terms of my, like if I'm reading the Key of Solomon or something, I'm like, oh, this is dope because I get what they're doing here, mm -hmm. right? I can execute on this and I can do it the same way a priest would with the same intent. And mm -hmm. so I can take and make these Eucharists at home and you can take and do this Eucharistic stuff at home. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of learning to direct that intent. So sure. it's like the Protestants didn't take it far enough. The rituals are fine. It's the, <laughs> it's, it's the fact that you need the uh, intercessor that's the problem, right? That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Makai, I wanted to know, um, how, what, are, what is the process for uh, saints in the EGC? That is an excellent question. So we have the saints that were given to us by Crowley in the Gnostic Mass. And then the additional saints that have been added uh, include Giordano Bruno, who you may remember from our little essay on memory. But the, the, I don't know what the exact process is, but the final decision rests with which is Hymenaeus Beta. I will say so that- I know that's not is, exactly a full answer. There, there is a process where you can nominate um, a historical figure if you feel that they have the qualities uh, to be included with the Gnostic saints. You can actually go ahead and write an essay I think you have to be third degree to submit it, if I'm not mistaken. You're talking but, about for the Order of the Eagle and the Order of the Lion, though. Right. And you can actually, and then, and then they will actually consider it. And if they agree with you, uh, you, may see, you may see the person added to the list of saints. But um, that's certainly something that you, as a member of the Order, if you feel that there's somebody um, that should be included, let them know. Thanks for adding that, Steve. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Questions, comments, rude remarks before we move to Crowley's actual words? Well then, sweet, let's move to the essay. Um, per usual, I have tried to put all of Crowley's actual words in the essay on slides that look the same so that when you see this slide with the little book with the bookmark that says Beatitude, the words on the left are the words of the essay. Since I've yapped a lot, Wendy, will you please take it away and read our first section? Okay, there are two well distinguished forms of the beat, oh no, <laughs> the beatific, is that how you pronounce it? Vision? Good enough. Okay, the higher pertains to Kether and is thus proper only to the epistemus, though it may be enjoyed sporadically and, as it were, by accident, by those of lower grades. It is of extremely rare occurrence and has indeed never been described in any detail. It may even be said that it is doubtful whether any account of its true form has ever been given to the world. It need only be said in this, in this place that its formula is love is the law, love under will, and that its nature is the perpetual sacrament of energy and action. It is dependent upon the perfect mastery of the mysteries of sorrow and of change, with thorough identification with that of individuality. So just a note here that uh, Malkuth is associated with the trance of sorrow, which we discussed uh, in our little essay, Sorrow, and Yesod with the vision of change. And just to make it crystal clear, I made you some more little donuts. 
Um, the higher pertains to Kether up there at the top. That's where the AA grade of a pessimist is. I know, Vanessa, you can laugh. I tried really hard to make those full circles and it was just like, no, you get a donut. I just said, I was just telling Dan that I was like, I like those little donuts. They're super cute. <laughs> um, so, and Crowley continues, it, it is dependent on the perfect mastery of the mysteries of sorrow, which is down there in Malkuth in the purple donut. Remember, that's the, uh, according to Crowley, that is the Saya, the material world, and it doesn't constitute part of the soul of man. That's just where the meat suit lives, okay? Uh, depends on the mysteries of perfect mastery of the mysteries of sorrow and of change. And change goes along with Yasod, which is just one little bump up. But when you move out of Malkuth into Yasod, you're moving into the formative world. And Yasod is where the Nefesh or the animal soul that kind of drives traffic with matter, it like, conducts the upper ruach down with the meat suit on the bottom and takes us where we're going. All right, uh, Vanessa, next section, please. Let us occupy ourselves with the lower form of this vision. So-called, it is not technically a vision at all, which pertains to Tiferet, and it's thus the natural grace of the minor adept. It may be said at once that those who have attained to higher grades, especially those above the abyss, can hardly return to this vision, for it implies a certain innocence, a certain defect of understanding that which is not possible to a master of the temple. Again, the grades of exempt and major adept are too energetic to admit of the, of the balanced quietude of this state. <laughs> only if the center of the tree of life, only in the self-poised security of the solar axis, can we expect to find the steady indifference to, to event which is the basis of the trance and that ontogenous radiance which tinges it with rose and gold. But before we unpack that a little bit, um, just a reminder over on the right there, Crowley has an essay about trance, which we'll talk about later when we get to the little essay toward truth, trance. Um, but he refers to trance as implying a passing beyond the condition, conditions which oppress. Whereas a vision is seeing something coming or seeing it in the distance or seeing it in the future or in front of you, as opposed to something that you are in the muck with right now, wrestling and trying to get your bad self over. So ontogeny, what the hell is that? Per usual, Crowley likes to show off his erudite vocabulary. And this is your 50 cent vocabulary word of the day. Ontogeny is a word of Greek origin. It has three roots, ontos, being, that which is, aimi, e, I am, genia, made of production, mode of production. I'm not a Greek scholar. I didn't put the words there in Greek letters because I don't know how, and I'm not even sure those pronunciations are correct. So if you are one of those people, feel free to pipe up and correct me. The word ontogeny as used in English refers to origination and development of an organism. Now this is not uh, evolution. This is the development history of an organism with own, within its own timeline. So from the fertilization of the egg until you know the body is in the casket in the grave. In the anthropology, this is, this word ontogeny is used to refer to the process through which each of us embodies the history of our own making. And I really liked that thought. I think of anthropology as being, you know, physical anthropology, you, you dig up stuff like an archeology span and figure out what it was for and what people did with it, but also the cultural anthropology of, and how did the society function? So on an individualized level, the process by which I embody the history of my own making is on ontogeny. Um, also, just to show off that Crowley's showing off just how much he knows, remember we talked about um, earlier one of the other essays, we talked about what was going on with evolution and the conflict between science and religion. Ontogeny is four primary questions of biology. So Crowley's kind of showing off not just his vocabulary, but his greater cultural reading outside of just the, the context of spirituality. So the lower form of beatitude, that's what we're talking about. It is below the abyss. 
When Crowley refers to those who have attained higher grades, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the assignment of the AA grades and of spiritual progress, I thought it would be helpful to map them out. So you can see that uh, Crowley referred to hanging out in this vision or having this vision refers to a certain defect of understanding. And understanding is the common English translation for Bina, which is the light blue donut. Um, a master of the temple or magister templi is the grade that pertains to that um, sephira. So essentially, excuse me, once you cross the abyss, you ain't coming back, at least not to this trance. Uh, now, what I found interesting is Crowley also referred to the exempt adept or the adeptus exemptus, which is over in Chassad. Const uh, did I get that right? Or do I have those backwards? Please tell me I got that right. I may have to fix that. I got them backwards. My bad. Sorry, guys. Uh, exempt adapt should be where the green donut is, even though I have it in blue on the text. And likewise, the major adapt um, should be hanging out in the blue donut. So Gabura and Strength are the blue donut, and Chesed and Mercy are the green donut. So of why the grades can't return to the vision is because they are too energetic to admit of the balanced quietude of this state. Does anyone uh, who have any thoughts on that? Whether or not you know anything about Kabbalah? I'm just interested. <laughs> you don't have to. Okay. Uh I, yeah, jump in. I have some kind of half-formed idea. Um, like in science, th there's a process of diffusion where, um, where things move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And mm -hmm. so I think that it, with these two opposing elements, they're, they're on, you know, there's one on the positive pillar, the one on the negative pillar. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to move their own influence the other way. And so there's, there's, probably not going to be much time when they would want to stand still just because of their nature. I'd buy that. That makes sense. Anyone else? All right. So once more, just that one. Oh yeah, go ahead. Well, is this theoretically once you cross that abyss, you were kind of losing duality and below the abyss, you have duality. You have the two that are both uh, opposite and in, uh, in nature and above it. So once you've brought all those together, you can't again go back to division. I like it. Uh, this little bit, the lower form pertains to Tiferath. It's the center of the tree, solar access. We have that reference to sun, hence I made it a yellow donut. See, I'm being all clever and color coordinated. Um, and then we have this ontogenous radiance. So the, the development of, of the entity within its own lifetime is what tinges it with rose and gold. Splendor, spirituality, balance, harmony, the sun. And remember in um, Crowley's map of the human consciousness or the human soul, as it were, um, if you've got the little essay toward truth book, you can take a look at that tree of life diagram. If you don't, you can take a look at the one I've got on the page. Um, all of these Sephiroth here from Yasod up to um, Chesed and Gabura are, are in the uh, formative world of Yatsura. So they're not in the material world. But just these five with Tifereth in the middle and two on the left and two on the right, this little five bit is the Ruach portion of the soul, which Crowley described as being sort of the mind, spirit, intellect, mental, moral faculties, and the ego. And uh, the Tifereth is like the driver. It's like the captain of, that, of those five Sephiroth. So I thought it was interesting that this uh, lower form has to happen within the center of the Ruach, not off to one side and not in another part of the soul. All right, let's have some more essay. Nick, will you take this one, please? This trance differs notably from most others in a way which the above stated conditions would lead us to expect. 
It is psychologically a state as opposed to an action or an event. True, all states of somatic intensity are in a sense timeless, but it may be said that most of them are marked by well-defined issues of a critical character. That is, the entry to each is quasi-spasmodic. In this case, however, we find no such diagnostic. I didn't know what the heck spasmodic was. Um, it's kind of what it sounds like. It's related to the word spasm. So it is occurring or done in brief, irregular bursts. Uh, samadhi, which relates to that word somatic. This is a word that Crowley borrowed from, um, essentially from Pali and from, I think it's the same in Hindi, but also Sanskrit. And that is the state of concentration achieved through meditation. Are you getting that I'm throwing some hints down here? Because I do this every, every time I do one of these. Um, anyway, it's, it's regarded as the final union with the divine before or after death. So thoughts on this trance differing from the others being a state as opposed to an event, being timeless, relating to spasms? Bueller? Uh, I had a, another half-formed thought if you want one. Yeah, sure. Um, it reminds me of uh, the three gunas where it's, it's sort of, I think it's easier to settle into either rajas or tamas than it is to get into that, that spark of sattva. And mm -hmm. so it seems like it's the kind of thing you'd, you'd find by accident, sort of like the Balmer Peak where uh, I don't know if, if everybody knows that term. It's, it's something on, that Randall Monroe did on XKCD, where when you start drinking, you 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 get kind of slower and less less good at anything. And then there's this sudden sudden peak where you're great at everything and everything's easy. And then you drink some more and, and you're crap at it again. So it you know it, it sounds like that kind of thing to me. Yeah. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the three gunas, uh, rajas, tamas, and sattva, they are considered the three essential qualities of all things in uh, a part of the Hindu tradition. Um, rajas or rajasic energy is like high, like the epitome of it is high, frenetic, like raw. Uh, tamas or tamasic energy is epitomized by lazy log. And sattva or sattvic energy is depending on who you talk to, again, your mileage may vary, either the balanced point or the pure spiritual state. So these three concepts, there's a lot of threes in spirituality, you might've noticed, um, but these three concepts are what make the three humors essentially of, um, Ayurveda. They're like the three humors of Ayurveda. All right. Wendy, take it away. The trance may be continued for weeks or months, and the most ardent devotee of Tahuti, searching his magical record with the most conscientious acuteness, finds it impossible to indicate the onset of the vision. In fact, it may be surmised that the vision arises not from any given action, but rather from a subtle suspension of action. The conflict of events has ended happily in a state of serenely perfect balance in which Though energy continues to manifest, its issues have become without significance. So most of you probably are familiar with Tahuti, who is an analog, but not identical to Thoth, Hermes, and Mercury. Um, they are all gods of writing. They are scribes. They are messenger gods. They, are, they oversee communication. But Tahuti is also the god of magic. And in talking about the magical record here, Crowley is re referring specifically to the practice of keeping a magical diary, um, which I kind of think of as the, the lab notebook of scientific illuminism. Like when you take high school biology, you have to keep that lab notebook, which is like, okay, here are the conditions of the experiment. And like, I did this for the experiment and here are the results and here are my thoughts on it. Anyone have any thoughts on this bit? Well, in my experience in keeping a magical diary, what I can say in retrospect is that you do end up with a lot of this. <clears throat> you look back at your rituals, you can see how everything kind of comes to fruition. And like eventually you come to this place where you're like, 
oh, everything's working out perfectly, exactly as it should. I don't need to worry about anything. I just need to see what my will is and do rituals in line with that and kind of things will happen as they should. Hmm. So those are kind of my thoughts on it, just like experientially. Yeah. Who else? Vanessa? I can only see a few of you, by the way, because of how my screen is set up. So okay. if you put your hand and I don't call on you, it's because I don't see you. So you should just jump in. <laughs> um, the, I, we just listened to it. You cut out, Vanessa. I'm hoping you will unfreeze. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. I Good. thought it might just be me. Can you hear me? The internets are working. We can hear you. Sometimes the pipes are clogged. Yeah, my computer is lagging a little bit. All right, I'm going to give Vanessa like another minute to see if she reappears. In the meanwhile, does anyone else have a comment they'd like to share? She's back. I have a short one. Um, Bring it. it. It makes me think of the Six of Wands because he's talking about energy continuing, but it's perfectly balanced. Excellent. I like it. Vanessa, are you back? Yes, we are. Sorry. <laughs> I was just, Tell us what you got. <laughs> yeah, I was just um, saying that uh, we just watched a talk uh, or listen to a talk with Veer at Star Sapphire OTO. And um, he happened to be talking about the magical diary in a way that, um, you know, when you, when you have this diary, this record, and you go back and you review your record, you get to be the observer, which is kind of like the, um, what we are aspiring to do as we unite ourselves with our Holy Guardian Angel. It's kind of like the the easy way to kind of get to have like that out of um, out of touch, out of emotion experience with your own magical work. So, uh, and I thought that was really interesting. I never really thought about it like that, being able to go back and look at it and see like um, how you, you know, recorded a certain event, whether you were honest about it or if you were lying and later on you're like, why did I, I you know, I must have beat that up for my ego, you know, and um, and to take account of those things and to and to mark those things and kind of um, can use that information to to guide you towards your will. I thought mm -hmm. that was really cool. Yeah, excellent. Anybody have thoughts before we move on? <clears throat> so, all right. When talking about the BS, mm -hmm. um, it feels like it's almost like a momentum that you get when you're you've got that positive energy going and you've got a momentum and like is almost like forgetfulness that that's going mm -hmm. not what they're kind of trying to explain in here if you haven't read the essay that's coming up if you have read the essay you're jumping ahead okay. but hold, hold that thought because i'm gonna i'm gonna be like joel you said this talk to me okay all right all right I, I was thinking that last one, I was reading it, and I just recently met uh, Stephanie, who we invited here, but she has her kids this uh, weekend, so she's not here. But um, she was, that last one kind of almost sounds like uh, what she describes as thinking of the easy button. Just think that something is going to be easy to accomplish and accomplishing it then becomes easier because you're not focusing on how annoying or difficult or whatever or something accomplishing that is good. Yeah. That's very interesting. <laughs> so I think maybe that's kind of what it's, it was talking about there. I guess in his own words. <laughs> Right. Vanessa, will you take this one? We may, we may compare the condition with the return to health of a fever-stricken man, the alteration of pyrexia in subnormal temperature has subsided. He forgets gradually to consult his therm 
thermometer at the accustomed intervals, becoming absorbed instinctively in his regular pursuits. At the same time, he is no longer aware of the hot and cold spells, but half consciously of uh, the quiet glow of health. Simil similarly, in the vision, all conscious magic efforts ceases, although the practices are continued with all customary diligence, and the whole of the adept's impressions, internal as external, are suffused with the glow of beauty and delight, the state in many respects closely akin to that sought by the smoker of opium, but it is natural and requires no artificial regulation. Which is Pyrexia doesn't refer to those fancy Pyrex cooking dishes. Uh, it just means raised body temperature, like having a fever, because Crowley had to shove his vocabulary. But Joel, this business about forgetting, what do you think? Yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about, is like that momentum where it's going so well that like, you don't even realize it, you're doing what you're doing to get those results, that kind of, mm -hmm. what they're hinting at. And this kind of piggybacks or is related to what Dimitri was saying about, you know, it's not so much effort. Like you do the thing, but you're not efforting at it. You're doing it and it's like a flow state. In my least humble, your mileage may vary opinion. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Well, I think it's really like the, the last part there where it's talking about um, a smoker of opium, but it's natural and but it is natural and requires no artificial regulation. Uh, that ability to do magic and to, to get these results from our practices and stuff is like um, how I feel about like the front door uh, way of achieving certain states that you can sometimes get by cheating when you do other substances, um, you know, drinking or whatever that you choose, but like this way you don't have to have like a regulation. You're, you are, you know, equilibrium for the attainment that you're receiving. So huh? it's very, it's, I really, um, I really like that. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Uh, I like the image of the whole of the adept's impressions, internal and external, are suffused with the glow of beauty and delight. And it, it led me to think of that line that the deacon has in the mass where they say, let the rituals be rightly performed with joy and beauty. This joy to me kind of goes with delight. So if you have any other thoughts about beauty and delight, or maybe have noticed Crowley using these terms in other places, dish it. Represent the rose and the cross. Ooh, very good. Very good. So we've had the rose, rose and gold as references, but the rosy cross is one of the symbols of Tiferoth, which with, which with this vision is associated. So yeah, totally right on board. Thoughts, complaints? There's only a little essay left. Okay, maybe that's not true. Uh, Nick, you're up. It will appear from the foregoing that nothing can be more absurd than to attempt to give instructions for the attainment of this state. To aspire to it, and still worse to seek to regain it after it is passed, must appear the climax of bad logic, nor delectable and blessed as it is, can one call it actually desirable. So I've read all this stuff about joy and beauty and delight and balance and flow state, and now Crowley's telling me that I shouldn't be aspiring to it. Hello, anyone? Why is blessedness undesirable? Give me your thoughts. I'm dying here. You know, I, I would say um, how like in the Mass of the Phoenix where it's like, save me from good and from evil. Like you don't want to be one more than the other, like to have that balance. And uh, so I, that's kind of where I like maybe being blessed um, would be not really the desired state for a magician. So definitely not the end goal. I'm with you. I have a thought. Yeah, what you got? Um, it might be that, I mean, I'm just guessing here. It could be sort of like putting the cart before the horse where mechanically um, you're, you're gonna want your car to be able to go, um, you know, 
you know, when we want it to, but you, you don't want to start, uh, you, you don't, like, you have to turn the key in the ignition first. You, yeah, it, things have to be done in the right order. Yeah, you wouldn't take that car, like, let's say you bought a junker and you were going to fix it up, you wouldn't start with the body. You'd make sure the engine worked first, right? It's prettier to start with the body and to make everything, you know, repaint it and to get a racing stripes and chrome hubcaps, but like maybe you want to make sure that you got an engine. Anybody else have thoughts about why this state of beatitude is somehow undesirable? Yeah, I have an idea that it's like if you go and you're going to make yourself a seeker, right? Well, when you make yourself a seeker, you sort of create a block for yourself in that this seeking is the thing that now gets in your way right and it's only like if you can't find your keys right and you're looking all over the house for your keys you probably won't find them but then the minute that you give up you're like oh shit they're right there on the counter the lost of results yeah yeah i was gonna say on, on a smaller scale i think there are those moments of surprise in, in your rituals i mean i was i was doing something this morning and you know had an experience in that that just completely caught me off guard and was one of those wow moments of delight mm -hmm. where you know trying to seek that and force that would not have brought that result mm -hmm. it, it had to be something that was organic that that happened other thoughts <clears throat> could it be maybe being complacent in one spot for too long sure i mean I mean, this sounds all good to me, right? It's rosy and gold and balanced and delectable and blessed. Like, why wouldn't I want to just sit in Tiferet and eat bonbons, right? I mean, remember one of the one of the comments um, that Gareth Knight made, or from Gareth, that I took from Gareth Knight's book earlier, was that exoteric religion, right, the outside stuff, can get you only this far, can get you only to this state of like blessed, blissful beatitude. That's like the Better Business Bureau for religion, right? Don't pick one of those that only gets you to blessed and beatified. Like, you, we need to move forward. I mean, that was essentially why I left Catholicism, right? Is because I hit this point where I was like, there's literally nothing else that, that this has to offer you except, well, like, live a good life and follow these rules and one day you'll be rewarded. Yeah, that takes me back to um, the Beatitudes and the canonization of saints within the um, Catholic Church. So the way, when I first uh, went to Spain, I went to visit uh, a cathedral. The very first cathedral I went to was in Sevilla, and it used to be a mosque. So it's very big in southern Spain. And there's a sign on the wall that points downward to these stairs that says, El Brazo de San Lorenzo. And that literally means the arm of St. Lawrence. And I thought, oh, he must have been some dude that like died here fighting to turn this into a cathedral. And I'm expecting to see his sword, right? The arm of St. Lawrence. And I was, and what do I see in a glass case? An actual free arm in a glove, in a box. So my, my explanation of how Catholicism works, uh, it, it kind of cheeky, is if you're not a good Catholic in the Middle Ages, you can't get buried in a cemetery that's a Catholic cemetery and you'll never go to heaven. So you'll never get to be with God and that's very bad. If you're a good Roman Catholic in the Middle Ages, you can get buried in this Catholic cemetery and have a Catholic funeral and you can get to go be with God and be in a blissful state and hang out in heaven for all of eternity. If you're a really good Catholic, when you die, we'll cut you up and auction off your body parts at, uh, at market value to make some bank for the church. And you'll get buried in bits and pieces all over Europe. <laughs> because literally cathedrals are required to have a relic and primary relics are pieces of dead saints. It's kind of a bummer because I love the idea that like my, you know, patella could be like hanging out underneath somebody's altar in Italy and my other patella could be hanging out underneath an altar in like Africa or something. But I picked the wrong religion. You might be able to make so, happen for you, Makai. More. <laughs> if, 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 if you want, Makai, we can go ahead and cut you up when you die. We'll, we'll divvy you up. 
<laughs> Doesn't that sound fun? Like I bequeath each of the different bones in my body to a different local thalamic organization to carry as their holy relic. Like, please put me inside a lance. As your home body, we get dibs on your head. <laughs> I was joking with uh, Dionysus Soter, who's a bishop in our, our church, that you know when he dies, we want to keep his brain in a jar on Sabazius's desk. <laughs> anyway, nor delectable and blessed as it is, can one call the state of beatitude actually desirable. Wendy, you're up. We need not assume that it is in any way deleterious, that it exhausts good karma or that it wastes time and damps aspiration. It should be accepted when it occurs with calm indifference, enjoyed to the full, and quitted without regret. Its occurrence is in any case clear evidence that the adept has reached a definite and rather exalted state of being, since he can live so many hours without being perturbed by the incidence of any motive force. It implies a marked degree of attainment of internal and external control. It provides the possibility of perfect repose in the midst of the greatest activity and thus indicates the solution of the ultimate problem of philosophy, the prone to the conquest of the three characteristics. It should encourage the adept in his aspiration by heartening him to confront the appalling postulate of the abyss. It should serve him as refreshment and nourishment. It should assure him of the possibility of perfection in the greater work by demonstrating its existence as a crown to the less. Forgive my failure to number all of the commentary in the white box. We'll talk about the ultimate problem of philosophy in a moment. A proem is in fact not a typo, but a preface or a preamble to a book or a speech. Again, you got three vocabulary words today. That's pretty good. Uh, I did not know what the three characteristics were, so I looked them up. Um, they are the, they come from Buddhism. And remember that Crowley was a Buddhist for many years before he wrote this particular work and was in fact a practicing Buddhist when he uh, received the book of the law. So. The three characteristics, notice they're in caps, are also known as the three marks of existence in Buddhism. And these are impermanence, suffering, and non-self. We'll go into that in depth in a minute. But notice that he ends by saying this demonstrates that it exists as a crown to the less. With Kether as the crown at the very top, the crown to the less would be the crown of Kether as being reflected into breath. So bearing that in mind, Hey, look, something about meditation. I'm dropping a hint. It implies a marked degree of attainment of internal and external control. If you've been attending all these essays, you've seen this slide before in a slightly different form. Um, Crowley is again pitching meditation here as you know, practice strengthens skills. Meditation leads you to that point of equilibrium. Um, and as several people have mentioned, that state of equilibrium um, is this, this particular vision of beatitude, right? There's the idea that you could get complacent here because it's all nice and cozy, but you've hit a certain point of balance. So as Crowley said in Magic Without Tears, concentration does indeed unlock all doors. It lies at the heart of every practice as it is the essence of all theory. And almost all the various rules and regulations are aimed at securing adeptship in this matter. All the subsidiary work, awareness, one-pointedness, mindfulness, and the rest is intended to train you to this. But let's talk about what the hell the ultimate problem of philosophy is, because that was another one. I'm like, wait, so this is supposed to tell me that there's a solution to the ultimate problem of philosophy? Uh, I don't know what the problem is, so what solution am I looking for exactly? And if you Google ultimate problem of philosophy, you come up with a hot mess. So here's what I learned. One of the branches of philosophy, or one of the, the key areas that, that philosophy seeks to solve is epistemology. And that is like, what is true, right? Tell me about knowledge. So what I found, I found three ideas of the ultimate problem of philosophy. One that would have been very applicable in Crowley's time is trying to reconcile ration, rationalism and empiricism. The so rationalism says that knowledge and therefore morality is based on reason and logic. But empiricism says knowledge is derived from experience and experimentation. The so rationalism relies on things like math, 
like mathematics, very rational. Empiricism says, well, we need to do some scientific experiments to get knowledge, but experiments can't give us certainty. Like we know that if we put these two things together, we get this result, but is it always that way? Like no matter what, under any circumstances, mm, it's only partial knowledge. Rationalism sees the mind as more active and empiricism sees it as more passive. So in rationalism, the active mind takes in information from the senses and then gives it meaning. And in empiricism, the passive mind, it's more of a passive mind that like acts mechanically. It just, did I screw, I think I missed those two up. Yeah, I'm sorry, you guys, this slide is slightly incorrect. Where, the, where it says active mind that gives meaning to information from the senses, that should be under empiricism because that giving meaning goes to the experimentation and knowledge whereas rationalism goes along with that passive mind that acts mechanically according to knowledge. Hi, Dad. You know, you would never know how many hours I spent on these slides for as many errors as I put in them, sorry. But rationalism was um, obviously something that Crowley was familiar with. Uh, you might've heard of Pythagoras or Plato or Rene Descartes or Brooks, Spinoza or Immanuel Kant, they're all rationalists. Whereas empiricism goes back to the Hindu philosopher Kananda, who dates back to the area of Vedas and Vedanta, um, Aristotle, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, George Berkeley, David Hume. Something else I found while looking at how to reconcile rationalism and imperialism were a bunch of references to an individual named William Wewell, or Waywell. Uh, he was um, the master of Cambridge um, through the middle of the 1800s. And remember Crowley did his schooling at Cambridge towards the end of the 1800s. So he definitely would have been familiar with Waywell's teachings. Um, and Waywell was one of the last like dabblers in everything. He, you've never, I'd never heard of him. So if you have, you're more nerdy than I am and mad props for that. Um, but he had important contributions to mathematics, science, to philosophy, and to many other fields of study. So the second idea of what the ultimate problem of philosophy is, is, hey, is there a knowledge that can guarantee it's true? Like, is there a way to know something? I know that thing and I know it's true. And the third idea came from Camus. Um, and according to Camus, suicide is the ultimate problem of philosophy. So do what thou wilt with that. Wait. The, yeah. Um, I, can I put out here that maybe you didn't make a mistake as far as the active and passive because even though it says in 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 the line active mind that gives meaning to information from the senses and senses is generally the area of empiricism i think that in this context it's talking about making generalizations like when the apple falls out of the tree and isaac newton's like oh hey i get gravity like i think that 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 is rationalism hmm. And, what, and as, as far as the passive mind acting mechanically, that's just reading through your notes and looking at the statistics and then being like, okay, well, I guess that's it. That's true. Um, this is not my specific area of expertise. Uh, and I put the slide together yesterday, which was a very long time ago in my mind. So it, it's possible that you're right. But the, 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 the basic contrast is between reason and logic and personal experience and experimentation. Anybody else before I move on to the Buddhist stuff? Also, Wendy, your cats got really quiet. Are they okay? Oh yeah, I'm actually at a different cat house and you just can't hear the one that's been yelling at me on and <laughs> off the whole time. She's incredibly loud because uh, I've muted myself. <laughs> Right, so the three characteristics, and again, just like on the last slide, I now have the actual quote of the text that Crowley has over in the little white box on the right. Um, the three characteristics or the three marks of Buddhism, at least in the school Crowley came from, because in some schools there are four. These are impermanence, which in Pali is anicca and Sanskrit is anitya. This is the idea that all things are in flux, change is constant, nothing lasts and everything decays. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in when we talked about the essay about sorrow. Same thing with suffering, this idea of unsatisfactoriness, uh, regardless of how you spell it in, in both Pali and in Sanskrit, the word is dukkha. Um, this includes both the physical and mental suffering, but also the suffering that's created by your attachment 
recognize that impermanence is a thing. And so the fact that you're attached to being you know, young, fit and hot or whatever, it's, it's, gonna, fl it's gonna go, everything keeps moving. Um, the third of these three characteristics is non-self, which in Pali is anatta, and in Sanskrit, I'm missing the S, sorry, is anatman. And this is the idea that there is no unchanging permanent self in living beings. This drives very well with Crowley's mapping of the parts of man, or the parts of the soul of man. If you go back to the first essay, Crowley says that everything below the abyss, right, where we live, the parts of man are actual things that we can experience, but they are not real. It's only above the abyss that we get to experience reality. So in ourselves as living beings, there is no unchanging permanent self or soul that we can experience. Um, and then also that idea of non-self also encompasses that anything that we can experience has no abiding essay. It's all going to be um, permanent. Remember Crowley said in the first essay that initiation is the journey toward the ideal or the real. Initiation is that journey toward the abyss to cross into the ideal or real, or perhaps it is truth because we have little essays toward moving in the direction of truth. Maybe, thoughts? I know I'm a cheese ball. All right, um, Vanessa, will you take the next one? Uh, moreover, the enjoyment of delight and the apprehension of beauty and all things, even on this plane where analysis has not yet become acute, do actually fortify the heart and enkindle the imagination. This sounded to me like poetry, and I was looking for a little poetry that would go along with it. And that's where the Maya Angelou quote comes from. Beauty and delight. Uh, All right, Nick, the last one's you. Let therefore the postulant of the rosy cross pursue his path in solemn strength. Whoa. Never Sorry. Mind. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Let therefore the postulant of the rosy cross pursue his path in solemn strength, aware that at the proper moment he may receive, unasking the reward, and enjoy the revivifying flood of dulcet light, which has been called by the adepts the beatific vision. Light. Light. And over here on the right, that's a, that is one representation of a rosy cross. So you can kind of see. Um, if you were to fold the two, the red and the blue and the yellow in, and then you fold the other piece in, lid to the box. Thoughts? Do you know everything about me? Sorry. Anybody have any trouble whatsoever? Okay, if you're not talking, please mute. I'm getting some feedback. Anybody have any thoughts at all whatsoever about the, this essay, the concept of beatitude, how it relates to Tifereth, the symbols, the experience, your mileage may vary, yada, yada, what you got? Don't make me go all Spice Girls on you. <laughs> Tell me what you got, what you really, really got. <laughs> Thanks, Makai. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really know a whole lot of what I got from Beatitude, uh, but I, I really just am kind of thinking about like what what it is to to be in a vision and and how to relate that to my work and just some, a lot of good food for thought. Yeah. Anybody else? Be brave. All right. Well, thank you all for coming today. And if you're not a dues paying member of Second Mont, we would love it if you would throw us a couple of Benjamins uh, or Washingtons or Hamiltons or whatever you got. Um, you can find us at paypal.me slash Second Mont or at pdxoto.org. I'd also like to point out that um, for as much time as I spend working on these slides that are full of errors and all that kind of stuff, um, I really enjoy like I picked these essays because I thought this would be an interesting way to learn more about them. And I would invite you all 
to consider what it is that you're interested in and what you'd like to see offered as a class or as a discussion. And to think about taking the seat that I'm sitting in because you don't have to be an expert. I mean, I just read the essay, I Google some stuff, I look up what the words mean in the dictionary, I see if I can find other Crowley references, and then I throw it out there and ask what you guys think about it. And uh, I promise that you can do that too. So if you're interested, you'd like to host a class, please feel free to email our secretary, secondmot.secretary at oto-usa.org. And let me throw in there, um, yep. if if you, um, even if you don't know a lot about a subject, you can host a discussion. And if that's something you'd like to do, please get a hold of me at secretary. Yep, absolutely. So Steve can I ask a question about like, cause I came in like, and you guys had already been in a few chapters. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, uh, the change, or it goes from sorrow, and then what was the next one? Um, wonder. Wonder. So from sorrow to wonder, that transition, like, mm -hmm. the wonder comes from the sorrow, like we experience that in our lives, and then it brings us to like, why is thing, why is it like this? Why are we going through this? And then is that what they're kind of talking about? I would say yes, in part, um, because the trance of sorrow is associated with Malkuth and the vision of change, which is related to um, wonder and to the vision, what they call the vision of the machinery in the universe or the vision of stability in change, that change is the only thing that happens. Um, that goes along with the wonder of how uh, you know, how, how sort of perfect and weird and imperfect the world that we live in below the abyss is. Anyway, all of those things are connected to Yisod. So there's sort of a pattern in how Crowley's putting the essays together. Uh, so we've had the sorrow associated with Malkuth, but the vision of sorrow is also associated with Bina, right? We have all of those things about change. Um, and transition and wonder associated with Yisod, but they're also associated with other Sephiroth because they're all related. So he's sort of moving up the tree because now we're hanging out in Tifereth, but it's not an exact like one essay, one step um, correspondence. And some of these things kind of mesh across places, if that makes and sense. That's what I was uh, wondering is because like, I almost feel like from sorrow, it transitions into wonder pretty good. I mean, right? I feel yeah. like that's where I've been, where I'm at my lowest. And that's when you start thinking about like, okay, well, why is it like this? What's going on, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think with, with sorrow and with memory, um, both of those are available on YouTube and I know they've been posted. Um, so you can at least rewatch the discussion. You're stuck with me, sorry, I'm the leader for all these. <laughs> but um, you can kind of see how the discussion went on those topics and what it was that I was able to dig up. Awesome. All and right. also, you might have noticed I'm kind of a big fat nerd. And so I really enjoy picking these topics and digging. Like the, when we got into memory, I was like, why is memory important to magical practice? Like, where did Crowley get that idea? And what's the history of that? And what are some other things you might want to know? And um, so that's where some of the kind of beginning and ending material comes from that isn't strictly the words of the essay. And again, this is all just like me editorializing. Your mileage may vary. You may be like, uh, no, you're wrong about this and crazy about that. And that is not my experience. It should be left and two steps forward and you spelled that wrong, which I probably did. Um, and that's okay. Right, like Thelema is all about finding your will and doing it your way. And it's not my way or the highway, like with some of the other religions where you have to buy into doctrine. Anybody else? Thank you. Well, you were asking for rude comments. I've got one. Sure, bring it. <laughs> what kind of a name is Pope Sixtus the <laughs> Fifth? I thought that was hilarious too. I'm like, he's Pope 65. Wait, what? <laughs> All right. On that note, I will ask Steve to uh, hit end on the recording so we can yeah. post this before it degenerates. And if y'all want to hang out,